Now let's consider how do scholars study history. Historiography refers to the techniques, principles, and issues involved in the study of history. Historio means past, and graphi means writings. Historians use a variety of methods to study the past, and we'll take a look at some examples in this section. Many of psychology's earliest contributors published their work in books, magazines, and journals, wrote extensively in their personal journals, and exchanged written letters with other experts. By studying these historical writings, scholars gather a great deal of information about the development of psychology over time. Let's differentiate between the types of writings or sources studied by historians. Primary sources are first-hand accounts of history. This information was written by the person of interest, and it was created during the event or era being studied. Examples of primary sources include autobiographies, letters between two or more people, research notes, diary entries, and speeches. If we are interested in learning about Sigmund Freud, his letters to Carl Jung and Alfred Adler are a primary source of information. Secondary sources are secondhand accounts of history written by someone other than the person of interest, and it was created after the event or era has passed. Examples of secondary sources include biographies, journal articles, magazine articles, books, and interview notes. If we are interested in learning about Freud, Letters written by Jung and Adler qualify as a secondary sources. It's important for us to keep in mind that there are limitations to the study of history. First, the reliability and validity of historical information is sometimes questionable. That is, some evidence is biased. For instance, Carl Jung's autobiography was written by one of his assistants, and the goal was to show him a more positive light. Also, some evidence is missing or incomplete. Some of the earliest contributors destroyed their work before it could be shared with others. For example, John B. Watson, the father of behaviorism, burned his research notes, manuscripts, and letters to other psychologists before he died. Our understanding of Hermann Ebbinghaus and Gustav Fechner changed once we gained access to their personal diaries and papers, decades after their deaths. And we still don't have all of Charles Darwin's and Sigmund Freud's personal papers. A second limitation is that scholars shape the histories they write. Their understanding of past events is based on the information available to them and their perspective. Their personal biases, perceptual biases, and attributional errors impact their ideas and their articulation of those ideas. An example of this is Edwin G. Boring's version of history was filtered through his mentor, Edward B. Titchener, the father of structuralism. Titchener preferred experimental psychology over applied psychology, and he influenced Boring to basically ignore the contributions of the latter in his famous history book. Another example is that one of Sigmund Freud's biographers downplayed the extent of his cocaine use to help protect his reputation. Keep in mind, too, that different historians may interpret the same historical event or contribution differently. Some are more accurate than others, but it can be challenging for everyday people to know which historians do their homework. Fortunately, historians recognize the limitations of their methods and do their best to overcome them. As they find new sources and gather more information, their initial understanding of an event may evolve, slightly or drastically. So what you learn in these lectures could change by the time the next generation takes this class in 25 years. When scholars study the past, they try to use what is called a new history approach, which involves three concepts, historicism, external histories, and naturalistic histories. You'll learn about each of these concepts in the next parts of this lecture.